Hi folks, it's good to be with you and we're coming to the end of our day of apologetic notes. Uh, good to be with you. So, we're now going to be looking at the Quran, the textual criticism of the Quran. And I want to bring to your attention Um, please don't forget my website jasonburnspreacher.com but uh, this is a, a very technical video uh, and it's we're going to be looking at the Quran the textual criticism of the Quran okay so just get my glasses This is uh, by a guy called Dan Gibson. Now, Dan Gibson has been attacked by uh, Dr. King, um, and Muslims will attack his character, say he's not a scholar, etc. But uh, Dan Gibson's work it has been well documented in scholarly research, so I would, I would ask you not to listen to the ad hominem attacked by Muslims and by Western scholars. But I would ask you to go and read his work uh, and look at the sources that he provides. And you'll find that it's meticulously researched. And we're going to be looking, I'm looking at some of his research on early Qurans. And uh, I'm going to read some of this material out. And just what, what, what I'm concerned about with the Muslims is there's a, a complete dishonesty going on concerning Muslim scholarship. There has never ever been, and this is in the Cambridge Companion to the Quran, there has never ever been a textual edition of the Quran being made. And whenever the Bible is printed, there will be scholarly notes letting you know what manuscripts have been used, why they've been used, and how they've been used. But we don't hear that from the Muslim apologists. We don't hear that from their publications of their Qurans. And they will talk about the chain of narration that the Quran has been preserved by the chain of narration. It's, I would call it the chain of fabrication and I've done videos on the early sources of Islam to show you that the chain of narration cannot be substantiated, that it's a false chain. Uh, anyhow, so they try to protect the idea that the Quran has been preserved by saying it's been passed on from memory to memory, from generation to generation. Even when Muhammad couldn't remember his Quran, they say it was memorised by everybody and passed on. But even if that's the case, it isn't the case, but even if it was, we still got to deal with manuscripts and they give the false impression that the manuscripts have been preserved. Okay, and if they're going to do a publishing of a book, they've got to look at manuscripts, they've got to look at manuscripts and they've got to say what manuscripts they've used and why they've used it and they're not doing that. So there's a complete dishonesty going on amongst Muslim scholars, Muslim apologists in the Western world and a complete dishonesty going on and I'd like to just give some illustration of this and this is the work by Dan Gibson uh, on the early Qurans so I'm going to read the MS the location where it is the date uh, the date from AH so that that's a uh, Dating from Muhammad, yeah, it's like a, a, a uh, sorry, okay, so just listen to this information. Now this is going to be very, very tedious and boring, but if you're a Muslim, it's very important. If you're a scholar in textual criticism of the Quran you need to take note because you're not doing your job properly and if you are a Western academic you need to start writing on this material you need to start working on this material because it's ridiculous that I need, I, I need to say something else be very very wary of the scholarship that's being done on the Quran today by Western scholars and Muslim scholars the reason being is there's a lot of political 
manoeuvring going on in the academic world. A lot of the academics are post-colonial academics. And in the West, the post-colonial academics are very scared to criticise Islam because they're ashamed of their post-colonial heritage. So what you're tending to find is academic scholars who would rip into the Bible without, uh, without thinking twice are very reluctant to rip into and attack the Quran. So there's a lot of mollycoddling going on. There's a lot of um, uh, massaging Islam's back in the academic world. And so we're not get and, and also a lot of the uh, PhD, uh, a lot of the universities that are doing PhDs, you will find that either politically in the area there'll be a strong Islamic group, and so they're afraid to upset that group, or in the nation, or they're being financed. The university department, for example, Oxford, is being financed by a Muslim country. So. Academics who are getting financed, academics who are aware of the political influence of their area or nation of Islam are very, very reluctant on top of this post-colonial, oh, we don't want to offend Islam. Academics are very, very, very reluctant to criticise the Quran. And so you're not getting a true, honest view in the academic world today. I suggest you've got to go past the noise of the academic world and you've got to do your own research and there needs to be a new generation of scholars rising up that are willing to be honest and fair with the evidence uh, no matter what the cost even if they lose the tenureship at the university even if the university department loses finance from Qatar there's got to be a new generation of scholars that rise up that have a bit more backbone, backbone. And a new generation of scholars that have got to rise up and stand up against this political correctness and postmodern, uh, post-colonial uh, meandering and messing about, really. Uh, you know, yes, there, there are issues that we have to be honest about from the West. We, we were not right in certain things that we did in history yet. But it's not all negative. And we don't have to keep bashing ourselves over the head in, in our Western culture. There are many things in the history of our Western culture that we can be proud of and that we shouldn't be ashamed of. And also, like from a scholarly point of view, we, as, as professors and deans and professors and, uh, of universities, your job, your responsibility is to have the most utmost integrity as a scholar and to stand and say what the truth is and unfortunately rather than do that scholars um, are, are pandering to a post-colonial agenda and are not allowing the truth to come out about the, the, the real historical claims of Islam. The second thing that needs to be done is there needs to be a, an outright challenge from Western scholars to the Islamic world in, in the Muslim countries that their scholarship is not acceptable, that their scholarship is not, is not at the same level as Western scholarship. And, and, and the Islamic countries have to be called out on that. And uh, until you do that, there's going to be a lot of uh, dishonesty going on and a lot of um, pandering to scholarship that is not up to standard. For example, the Hadith sciences. That, there's no such thing as Hadith sciences. The Hadith sciences are not the same as the way we would uh, verify history in, in our Western culture. So, the vaunted uh, Hadith scholarship uh, it, 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 that supposedly verifies every nook and cranny with every name and every source is one of the greatest fabrications and myths of all time. And you Western scholars should call that out, but you're not doing it because you're post-colonialist and you pander uh, to the political correct brigade and you're scared of losing your finances for your universities and upsetting the political carts of the left who are gaining strength in the West from Islamic, uh, the growth of Islam who, you know, for example, in London, uh, Islam's quite strong in London 
the mayor of London is a Muslim, how did he get in? Because a large part of the Muslim population voted for him. So the left uh, need to cozy up to Islam in order to get the political agenda moving today. And many academics are pro-left. Uh, and, and so you're all in this agenda. And there's got to come a time when a new generation of scholars stand up and say, no, I'm just going to say it as it is. This is what it is about Islam. Whether you like it or not, this is the source. This is the Quran. This is the textual criticism of the Quran. Let's get this information out. The next generation of scholars will be crucified. But you will do more for Western civilization and culture if you start as as as, Mus uh, as Christian, uh, not just Christian scholars, but Western scholars. You will save the West from annihilation and disintegration if you start to write on the Quran and critique the Quran like you've critiqued the Bible. You will save the West. But if you continue to hide your head in the sand under, under your post-colonial studies and not say the truth, then Islam w will grow and will begin to have a massive influence and change our Western civilization into something that, God forbid, will be a theocracy and you won't be able to do your scholarship then. Your post-colonial studies will be thrown out the window. So let's go to uh, the early Qurans. Textual criticism. MS 01159, uh, after, af, af, after Muhammad, late 1st or 2nd century, Sana manuscript, image 142213b, shows 48, Surah 48, verse 24, with a variant reading. Um, Dam 01183. Late first second century, Sana manuscript contains eight, Surah eight two, and Surah eight eleven, and Surah eight forty one forty six. Missing two verses. We are looking for Dam one twenty five dot one. Late first century, Sana manuscript contains one to seven, two sixteen seventeen twenty nine, chapter seven twenty, chapter seven two o four, chapter six to verse seventeen. Chapter 26, 122 to 156. Uh, chapter 41, 116, missing the two verses we are looking for. So, so we're seeing now that Muslims who say the Quran has been preserved, it's total lies, utter lies, there are verses missing in these manuscripts. Right? So, you've got to do textual criticism whether you like it or not. And the Muslim scholars are not doing the work properly. They're not showing and honest with the public in the West about the fact that there are textual variants and verses missing in ancient Qurans. They're not being honest about this. And we haven't even started. Sinai manuscript begins with uh, Dam 12701 mid 1st century. Sinai manuscript begins with uh, 2265 and missing 48 to 55, 16. Missing two verses we are looking for. Dam 128 late 2nd century. Sana manuscript contains last of 33, beginning of 34, last of 34, beginning of 35, Surah 52, 40, Surah 53, uh, Surah 53, 25, Surah 53, 25, 54, 1, missing two verses we're looking for. Dam 1, 26.1, late 1st century, Sana manuscript contains... Uh, chapter 2, verse 1 to 50 to 164. Chapter 3, verse 45, 54. Chapter 14, verse 43, uh, 15 to 20. Chapter 19, uh, 90. Chapter 20 to verse 40. Chapter 40, verse 18 to 34. Chapter 42, 40 to verse uh, 45. Sorry about this. We'll get there. Um... 53 to verse 25, uh, 50, 44, verse 1, missing two verses. We're looking for Sana manuscript contains, right, sorry, chapter 2, verse 1 to 50, 164, uh, chapter 3, verse 44 to 55, chapter 14, verse 43, chapter 15, verse 20, chapter 19 to ver 
to verse 90 to chapter 20 to verse 40 chapter 40 verse 18 to 34 chapter 42 to verse 45 to 53 chapter 43 uh, so these are the Quranic verses uh, chapter 43 77 to verse 19 uh, chapter 46 uh, 26 to verse 32 missing the two verses we are looking for Dam o one thirty one second century Sunday manuscript contains chapter four verse one to four chapter seven verse forty four to fifty four chapter sixteen one to twenty seven uh, chapter seventeen verse eleven chapter eighteen verse seventeen to twenty eight chapter eighteen to forty six to forty six to sixty one chapter twenty to verse seventy five chapter twenty one twenty seven uh, chapter twenty one verse fifteen chapter twenty two verse seventy eight Chapter 23, verse to 27, verse 27, chapter 55 to 51, chapter 56 to verse 22, missing the two verses we are looking for. Second century, uh, Dan 1, 321, Sinai manuscript contains 2, 31, 38, uh, 5, verse 48, 54, 5, 72, 80, uh, chapter 7 verse 3 and 6, chapter 7 verse 50 to 67, chapter 36 verses 2 to 6, chapter 37 verse 20, missing the two verses we are looking for. Dan 20 to 33, 1, late 1st century Sinai manuscript known as the Great Umayyad Quran contains 1, chapter 1 verse 1 and 7, Chapter 2, 39, 43. Chapter 55, 55, verse 55 to 78. Chapter 56, 1 to 20. Chapter 67, 21 to 30. Chapter 68, verse 43 to 52. Chapter 69, verse 1 to 50. Chapter 74, verse 56 to... Chapter 77, verse 24. Chapter 79, dot 25 to 34. Chapter 85, verse 1 to 5. Chapter 89, verse 13. Uh, chapter 90 verse 1, chapter 99 verse 2 to 100, uh, chapter 110 verse 2 to 3, chapter 114 verse 3 to 6, missing the two verses we are looking for. It is the Kufic script and as Surah Suri dividers. Uh, Quranic fragment, late 1st century. It's on islamicawareness.org text. Contains only Surah 3, 34 to 184. Quranic leaf, late 1st century. Contains only chapter 14, verse 19 to 44. Uh, it can go to Islamic awareness. Vienna, late 1st century. Contains only... A perg, sorry, sorry about this. We've got some gusses upstairs, but we will get there. Uh, late uh, A perga two, late first century contains only twenty eight, chapter twenty eight, verse sixty one, seventy three. I could go on and on and on. So what, what we're seeing here, I mean, I could, there's page and page and page of textual variants and verses missing in these chronic manuscripts. I could go on and on and on, I don't want to bore you. Um, but that's, that's just a small taster, Muslims, my dear Muslims of where Islamic scholars are not being honest with you. You have manuscripts that have verses missing, you have manuscripts with textual variants, and your Muslim scholars are not being honest with you. I've just read a few from one manuscript, the Sinai manuscript, okay? And I'm going to read uh, a few words by Dan Gibson here. During my research, I discovered that most Qurans have no date assigned to them. Many of those that do have dates are assigned dates that cover large periods of time, say 3 to 4th century AE. 
Even these broad dates are open to interpretation. Along with this, there are several schools of thought, each with their carefully presented arguments as to why some manuscripts may be earlier than others. So in other words, it's not a hard and fast rule to say that the manuscript is at certain dates, you know. Uh, Muslim scholars will come across as if everything's more certain about the dates of the Qurans. Uh, and I remember reading some top academic uh, on this issue and he said the same, I can't remember his name. But the dating uh, is not as accurate as Muslim scholars are saying concerning the dates of the Qur'an because we've, we've come to date some of the Qur'ans early in the first century of Islam and in the time of Muhammad. And so there's a big uha, oh we can date these Qur'ans early now. But like he said here, there's, a, there's still a lot of issues concerning the dating of these Qur'ans. And I suspect a lot of it's political, by the way. <coughs> vowels, for instance, to the casual observer it may seem that scripts without vowels, walk markings, must be earlier than those with vowels. This assumption is generally true, but for those who argue an early date for many Qur'ans, they feel that even though later Qur'ans were vowed, Early manuscripts of the Quran were originally written without vowels and the vowels were added by a later scribe making them appear to be from a later date. Another argument of those supporting earlier dates is that of Masaf or the business of copying Qurans. They feel that the first vowel system came in use shortly after the first Mashif were written and claim that some later Mashif was unavowed even from 400 AH. Those supporting an early date often refer to a manuscript known as Perf 558. Excuse me, this is a bilingual Greek and Arabic document from Ibnas, Ihinas, in Egypt, which dates itself from 2, 2 to 57 AH. This manuscript is vowed, demonstrating that Arabic script was vowed early. Therefore, one cannot say that Qurans without vowels are earlier than those with vowels. Those arguing against vowels being evidence of early writing also point to P. Perf 558. They admit that the early volume was occasion the uh, the volume was occasionally used in Arabic writing, especially if the the intended recipient did not speak Arabic well. Perf 558 is a good example of this. M. I. Abdallah, in writing to Greek in Heraclopolis, and thus. He added vowel signs to make sure that the Greek court clearly understood the message. On the other hand, they argued that all early Qurans were written without vowels because the intended audience were all Arabic-speaking Muslims. Albi Alba Fideli, page 3-4, notes, It was just in the 4th century A.H. that Abu Bakr ibn Mujadid, 324-9, uh, 936 accepted only the readings based on fairly uniform consonantal text and he chose seven well-known Quranic teachers of the second century declared that their readings all had divine authority than that the others lacked this story was made official only in the year 322-934 when the scholar Ibn Mishik Miksam was forced to retract his view that the consonantal text could be read in any manner that was grammatically correct. The following year, another Quran scholar, Ibn Shamdu, was similarly condemned and forced to renounce his view that it was permissible to use the readings of Ibn Madud and Ubaya. Script type. There were several types of early Arabic script, all known later as the Hijazi script, the Al-Hiri, the Al Ambari, the Al Makkah from Mecca, Al Medina from Medina. A later script was developed in Iraq in the area of the city of Kufa and was known as the Kufit script. Kufa was established as a military and administrative centre and contained tribesmen from Arabia rather than Iraqis. These tribesmen were given land as Nasib, uh, quote, Nasib uh, in. Uh, Quotations. 
On the eve of the First Civil War, an incident occurred from which we can only see that Nasib refers to land, not money or booty. There are no references to any early industries that focused on writing copies of the Quran. The famous author uh, Fahirist Ibn Nadim, who died around 390 AG, was the first to use the word Kufic, distinguishing from Hijazi script. Who like to date the Kufi script, are being very early, argue that Kufi script cannot have originated in Kufi since the city was founded in 17 AG. A A H and the Kufi script is known to have existed before that date. They do not. Ad they do admit that though the Kufi was the great intellectual centre that developed Arabic calligraphy, even eventually the Abbasid rulers adopted Kufic script as the norm, and it was used in the official Abbasid script. However, those that argue that the Kufi, being an early script, point out. That for many years the city of Kufi was involved in wars of intellectual Islamic struggle. During the Umayyad time period, Kufi was in the conflict with the Umayyads choosing their own caliphs over those in Damascus and fighting civil wars with the Umayyad caliphs. And we point out in this book they even used the same qui qui uh, quibilla as the rebels of the city, holy city. The people who, who turn to the same qui quibilla as us. Tabari 21107. Rather than the Quibilla used in Damascus, thus one would expect all early Kufi Qurans to support the Quibilla as Mecca rather than Petra. So we'll finish there. There's a lot of information uh, concerning the text of the Quran. Uh, So, what do we make of that? Well, I think what we see there, that, so this is Dan Gibson's source material from his books, which you can get his books, uh, I think you have to pay uh, on uh, Dan Gibson's website. Uh, so if you type in Dan, uh, Dan Gibson and the history of Mecca, you'll find his website. Um, so a few points about the textual criticism of the Quran there. Number one, it's quite clear that manuscripts do like verses missing. There are textual variants. That there's been no textual criticism of the Quran done, uh, a textual edition of the Quran, even to this date is an absolute disgrace, not only on Islamic scholars, but also on Western scholars. That's number one. And any claim that the Quran has been preserved and has not changed is an out and out fabrication and lie because there's no scholarship been done on it. Uh, and the scholarship that people are developing and, and are doing which is not mainstream are showing that the Quran um, has changed so for example Dr. Small who's written a, a very key book states very clearly that right at the beginning there were different Qurans but it, it, it early on it got standardized and then it's not changed much but the earlier Qurans there was a change going on there was a corruption going on but mainstream scholarship are, are not doing any real development of the text. They're not actually publishing Qurans and giving us the textual variants and things. Because that would just completely destroy the Islamic argument that the Quran has been preserved. So they don't want to do that. So they've set themselves a high bar, but they're not willing to prove their high bar. They're just leaving scholarship in some kind of osmosis where nobody's actually doing textual criticism publishing Qurans based on textual criticism so you have this scenario where at Hyde Park Christ, uh, Muslims are attacking the Bible on the basis of textual criticism but the intellectual dishonesty of them Muslim scholars and Muslim apologists at Hyde Park and online 
who are not willing to have their book criticised. And we find that with a, a Muslim apologist called Yahya Snow, who I said I would debate one of their debaters, who's an up-and-coming apologist who's going to be the next Shabir Ali, and he, he wanted to debate on the New Testament. I said yes, but why don't we also debate the reliability of the Quran? And they refused blank. They said no. Now, apparently this Muslim apologist has health issues, and that might be an excuse to some extent, but if he's willing to debate the New Testament, and he's well enough to do that, he should be well enough to debate the um, reliability of the Quran. So the bottom line is, what we're seeing is a complete dishonesty of the Muslim world and the Western academics in not doing a textual critical edition of the Quran. And what we've shown there in Dan Gibson's writing, that there are Qurans that are verses missing, and that's only we've only looked at a small tip of the iceberg. If I was to read all the material, we would have been here for about two hours. Right? Secondly, what Dan has shown there with the Kufi script and other scripts is quite clearly that there were political issues as to and cultural issues in using those various scripts. And if that's the case, then there's going to be nuances and influence on the copying of text where the cultural differences will come in and the political differences. These issues are hidden away to the media and to the public, Christian public and Western public. That the Quran, again, is probably a lot of it's been politically produced, not by Muhammad, but by those who political factions which wanted to emphasize various bits of the Quran to suit their own political agenda and so have left bits out of the Quran and put bits in in order to suit their own political agenda but how can we know this if we're not having open scholarship how can we know this if we're not having proper academic debates on these issues these issues are not debated they're hidden away um, and so you're, there's a mass deception going on uh, amongst the Muslim apologists at Hyde Park, uh, a mass deception going on um, amongst Western and Muslim scholars today, not looking at the textual criticism, doing textual critical editions of the Quran. Cambridge Companion says, and they're the most authoritative uh, group of scholars, that there's never been a critical edition of the Quran ever done. And number two, all the political and cultural influences of these Quranic texts need to be discussed in finer detail. There have been a few PhDs done on it, but we're not, we should be openly debating and discussing these issues uh, in the media and uh, publicly because there's a lot of problems with the Quranic texts that, that are being hid that we need to be looking at. It would take me hours and hours and years and years to, to do research on the political influences of the various Quranic scripts and how that has influenced textual criticism. This work should already be done by academics today. It should be widely available and openly debated and a, a lot of it's been suppressed. I know that Jay Smith has done stuff and I know that there are some scholars that have done stuff but what I'm saying is it should be coming from their own Muslim scholars themselves and Western mainstream scholars. But they're not facing up to the reality of some of these things. Okay, so let's close in prayer. So that's the textual criticism of the Quran. Number one, it's being hid, it's not being done. And number two, it was a political cultural production but we're not being able to get to the bottom of it because the scholarship is not being done properly on it. Uh, I think the best that we can hope for today is to cherry pick from the sheer sunny debate on the Quran. And uh, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to pick, pick and delve into that scholarship to try and draw out some of these issues of the, trying to look at the Shia and Sunni issue because the Shia and Sunni 
look at the early Quran and, and, and they look at it from a different perspective. So I'm trying to cherry pick from the uh, Shia scholarship in order to understand the Sunni scholarship and the Sunni scholarship in order to understand the Shia scholarship. But there should be a bigger scholarship going on, not between the Shia and the Sunni. There should be a Western scholarship that's much more vigorous and critical of the Quran on its cultural, on its script, and on its uh, textual veracity. Okay. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your love and your grace. We thank you for your blessings. And Father, we just pray that you be with us today. And I just pray, help the Muslims to see that this is not real, that this is not true. That the Quran isn't the word of God. Help them to see, Lord, that you died for them. Open their eyes. Speak to them, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Bless them, Lord, in Jesus' name. And raise up scholars that will stand up for you, Lord, and stand up for what's true. Raise them up, Lord, and may they speak out and say what's the real thing about the Quran. That it's a political production. It's not a revelation, but a political production. And Lord, raise people up to speak out. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. So thank you for listening. And uh, I think I'm going to just make one last video. Uh, and we're just going to do it on evolution. Okay. God bless you.